Hello and welcome to the Happy Profit Podcast. It is your favorite Sarah here. Now, just a note to all the other Sarahs out there listening or watching, I am sure you're everyone's favorite Sarah as well. So Sarahs all around rejoice. It's a great day to be alive. If it is your favorite, favorite, it is your favorite podcast, but if it's also your first time at the pod, an extra special welcome to you and all my return travelers. Well, welcome home, friends. Great to have you with me again today. I have a great episode for you with the magnificent Melissa Medina. She is just bursting with the joy of Jesus and is an absolute delight. You're going to love her. Before we get to the show, I want to let you know about Wesley Wednesday coming up this Wednesday, the 6th of September. Can you believe it? September. Oh my goodness. Hosted by Jesus Company, Wesley Wednesday is when we love to come together to fast, to pray uh, for the nations, uh, to bring them into the fullness of everything that Jesus has for them. And if you would like to join us, you can do so from 7.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. We stream through YouTube. So just look for The Happy Prophet, subscribe, and you won't miss it. It'd be beautiful to have you. And we love it when those praying with us interact, write in and comment. And it's it's just really beautiful to do it together. So we really value you in that space and can't wait to have you for an hour or so on Wednesday night. Why Wesley? It's a great question. Well, John Wesley uh, is known It's well documented that the great English revivalist uh, would fast and pray at least a day a week to see a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to see revival in England. And he saw it amazing tens of thousands in open air crusades receiving the gospel. It's just magnificent. I've been um, to an the area where he used to hold his crusades and oh my gosh, ah, so exciting. Do it again, Lord, do it here, do it wherever you are in Jesus name. And also the Lord said to me, Wesley Wednesday is a movement. It's a movement of prayer. And so we're doing um, what the Lord said. Hallelujah. So come and join us. But again, the easiest way to find it is to subscribe to my YouTube and it'll be there. If you want to know more, you can go to sarahcheeseman.com. But speaking of subscribing, subscribe to this podcast if you like, and then you'll be automatically notified of when it comes and you'll receive it directly to your device, uh, which is an easy way to do it. It's how I like to do it too. Now, the beautiful Melissa Medina, she's an amazing prophet and intercessor, absolutely devoted to Jesus. If you love intercession, this episode is for you. If you don't understand intercession, this episode is for you. She lays it out just stunningly. The insight, the revelation, biblically founded. It's beautiful. You're going to love it. Melissa, along with her husband, Anthony, whom you may remember, he's been a guest here on the show. They lead Hope Fires International, um, which is a beautiful ministry all about reviving hope in hearts and training and mentoring people in the prophetic and in prayer so that they can go and ignite hope. Um, throughout the nations. And so uh, it's such a delight to have her. Great news. They've just launched, Anthony has, um, an e-course, The Heart Posture for Prophecy. Melissa does teach on that e-course as well. And so I would highly recommend you going and checking that out, enrolling, do the course. You can do so at hopefires.com and find out more about them there. Uh, they're currently the pastors of prayer and prophetic ministry at Trinity Church in Cedar Hill, Texas, which I've been to. Um, that was fun. Uh, so you are going to absolutely love her wisdom, her insight, her understanding, the stories, the testimonies are magnificent. So get comfy, enjoy. And here she is, the wonderful Melissa Medina. Welcome, Melissa. It's such a joy to have you on the Happy Prophet podcast. Thank you for being my guest. Uh, well, I am so excited about being with you, Sarah. Thank you for having me on today. Oh, it's such a joy. It's an honor. Um, I am a big fan of the Medinas and <laughs> um, so, so blessed to have had you, had the opportunity to have you on the show. And I love everything that you're about. I know that you love the place of prayer and um, of course, that's the outworking of prophecy, which we'll get to today. But before we 
begin. I'd love just to hear a little bit um, of your journey um, at your testimony and your journey into prayer and prophecy. Yeah, well, I, I would say that my my journey in, in prayer and the prophetic actually began when I was a very, very little girl, six years old. And my dad, um, I was a daddy's girl and daddy at that time had been, he had been diagnosed with cancer and, um, you know, it was very advanced and we didn't know what the outcome was going to be. And um, at that time, my family was uh, into Catholicism and we had a, a room in our home that was like a shrine, you know, right. with just all of these different statues and, you know, and my grandmother, my mother would have myself and my sister, my little baby brother go in there, you know, day after day and just kneel before all of those statues and, you know, pray to them, do the rosary petition and, you know, mm. asking for our, our, you know, my dad to be healed um, wow. and just to spare my family of that, that situation, um, that hardship. And I remember as a little girl where I was so, I was frustrated because I was thinking, why do I, I need to pray to these statues? Won't, mm. won't, does God hear me for himself? And I remember wow. praying directly to Jesus. It was almost like this little, little defiance in my heart. And I was like, <laughs> To pray directly to God because if he's real he's going to hear me and he's going to answer wow. me and I started praying just directly to Jesus calling out to the Lord crying out for my dad's healing and my dad was healed at that time oh my life. gosh yes yeah, so uh family members that were born again Pentecostal came to visit him in the hospital with people from the church laid hands on him he gave his life to the Lord they laid hands on him he was radically healed of that cancer that throat cancer wow. he had and where my dad, you know, would probably wouldn't have been able to speak and tracheotomy and all of these things mm. that was, you know, diagnosed over his life. Um, he actually became a pastor and a preacher. And, um, and that started so, our journey. And I just remember when, you know, it took a while for my mom and the rest of my family to come to the Lord, but I would go with my dad, you know, everywhere. I wanted to be in every church service and every prayer meeting. And I remember going to like prayer meetings in the basement of a Catholic church that was during the charismatic Catholic renewal time. Right. Yep. And go to these prayer meetings in the basement of a Catholic church. And I would just hear everyone praying in tongues and praying in the spirit. And I'm like, what is this? And I, wow. I mean, I was so enamored with that environment. Mm -hmm. And I was just so hungry for more. By the age of eight, was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I was fully speaking in tongues and just, you know, had a prayer life with the Lord. And fast forward to um to when I was uh, in, in graduate school and moving from college into graduate school, you know, so I spent my life in the church, serving yeah. in the church, my dad as a pastor and all of that. And, um, and um, when I was in my college years, just really came into this, this pursuit of the Lord. Um, mm. and it was, it was at a time where I was pursuing a career in law. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, my heart was just so drawn into the depths of God. And I just wanted to, to know him more intimately and experience his glory. And, um, and I, I, so I, I just went into this season of pursuing the Lord. And I was at that time, I was in this dual degree program for my master's degree in, in public administration and policy, and also my Juris Doctor, my law degree. Mm -hmm. And I remember that during that time of seeking the Lord and just this, this hunger within me for more of God. There was one day that I, it's one of the few times in my life I've heard the voice of the Lord audibly, wow. but he came and he extended an invitation. He didn't demand, he didn't command me to do this. Mm. He asked me, he said, Melissa, will you lay down law school and legislate through prayer? And I didn't, wow. I, of course, you know, growing up in the church and all involved in prayer, I was in, you know, different like house of prayer movements. I, I had heard, I, I thought I was super familiar with prayer, but for the first time I heard those two words together, legislate, which was familiar to me from law school, you know, legal studies, and then prayer. And I didn't have a full understanding of what it meant, but I said, okay, Lord, whatever this means, I just know that it's better. Whatever you have planned for me is better than what I planned for myself. And you have my full yes. And I wow. pulled out of law school finished graduate school, but I pulled out of law school and I just said, Lord, okay, what's next? How do I prepare for what you're calling me into? And he said, I want you to prepare for, I want you to prepare yourselves. Anthony and I, my husband, Anthony, and I were married at that time. And I'm like, prepare for what? 
And um, and he says, I want you to prepare for, for full-time ministry. And I'm thinking, what have I been wow. doing all my life, you know, serving with my family <laughs> at the church when I was a little girl? But um, but that led me, led us into relocating to Dallas, Texas, um, to attend Christ for the Nations Institute. That's where Holy Spirit led us. Within the first couple of weeks, the Lord connected me to prophet and intercessor, you know, Cindy Jacobs. She says her first ministry and calling is always out of an intercessor, even before that of a prophet. Um, led me into alongside uh, Cindy overseeing a 40 day, 24 seven house of prayer that she was mobilizing within those first couple of months that we were wow. in Dallas, Texas, from there moved on to uh, serving as a director for um, Cindy Jacobs, General's International uh, National Prayer Network, hosting prayer conferences and strategic prayer strikes. From there, the Lord had me lay that that assignment down for a sabbatical season, and out of that sabbatical season, led me into a new assignment. Coming alongside Dutch Sheets, if you're familiar with him, he's he authored that flagship book, uh, Intercessory Prayer, um, mm. and that was several years of my life. You know, serving as a shadow writer and helping to birth different intercessory prayer initiatives. Um, and um, and then after that, a, a season of partnering with Lou Engel and these massive gatherings of the call, um, you know, just fasting and prayer. And um, and then another season uh, partnering with my husband in building a, a school of supernatural ministry where I primarily was teaching and ministering in the area of prayer. Um, and from there have come into serving as a pastor of prayer and intercession for my local church. And um, yeah. where I'm currently still serving today, and with with all of that, you know, being being so so privileged, with um, grace, with this privilege and honor to work alongside and and glean from so many generals in the prayer movement, mothers and fathers in this movement of prayer and the prophetic. I still I still tell you know when I when I teach on prayer, when I when I speak and share my heart on prayer, I say that. Um, in addition to all that I've received from all of these amazing, amazing leaders that the Lord has placed me alongside in the area of prayer, I say that my number one school of prayer has been learning to pray for my son. And um, our son, Caleb, our miracle son, our one and only son in the midst of infertility and multiple miscarriages. He was born with mm -hmm. congenital heart defects. And I won't share the whole story now, but he is an absolute miracle. And his his life and, and my journey as a mom, it has been one that has been fully cultivated in the place of prayer and contending for his life through multiple surgeries and multiple, you know, wow. just situations where we have seen the hand of God miraculously just in response to prayer. Wow. I love that your journey in prayer began in the miraculous and it's still in yeah. the miraculous. I love it. That's beautiful. <laughs> And thank you for sharing that. What a, a rich history with God. And um, you made this comment about what the Lord said to you about um, law school and beginning to legislate in prayer. For those who don't quite understand what that means, you said, I don't know. I didn't know what it meant, but I said yes to the Lord. For those who go, yeah, I don't know what that means either. Um, could you explain? Yeah, I think I'll begin with sharing just about, you know, the the identity of the church. And in, in the New Testament, when we um, see the word church, it's translated one of two ways. It's translated oikos, which is um, the family, the sheepfold, the household, um, you know, the congregation, the assembly, the community, right? Um, right. Our church family. Um, but the other word that church is, tra is, trans uh, is translated into is the word um, ecclesia. And that's another part of the identity of the church where we're not just a family, we're not just a sheepfold and a household and a congregation. We are the government of God on the earth. We yeah. are a legislative assembly of God on the earth where he gives us through the finished work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. He has given us authority so that we can actually legislate on the earth. We can determine, set boundaries in the spirit on what is permissible and what cannot be. 
where we use, mm-hmm. you know, the keys of the kingdom, so to speak, right? To open doors, to unlock and open doors to the will of God, to the glory of God, for the king of glory to come in. But we also use those kingdom keys for us to close doors and for us to mm-hmm. forbid and set boundaries on, you know, the work of dark, the works of darkness and what we will not permit within our our region, our, our, our nation, our state, within our household, even within our own thought life. So many mm. believers, many within the church, we grow up learning about prayer only from the perspective of, okay, where, where prayer is all about asking, it's all about requesting, it is all about petitioning, and that is that oikos, um, expression. That is that what I would also also call our priestly, you know, um, our priestly identity, our priestly anointing, where we minister unto the Lord and we also minister on behalf of other people unto the Lord, petitioning on their behalf, asking for the Lord, you know, on behalf of other people and situations, right? But then when we come into that ecclesia identity of the church, that is kingly intercession that's our identity as we're not just priests but we are kings we are a royal right we're we're a people where we're a kingdom of priests as it you know references in in revelation so in that identity and in that uh operating as kings on the earth as as god's royalty on the earth his royal priesthood right we also legislate in prayer we decree we declare right we we seek out what is and in order for us to decree and declare right in order for us to decree a thing and see it established in order for us to make declarations um in order for us to operate in that kingly intercession anointing we have to know what the will of God is. Mm. We have to know what is on his mind, what his dreams and desires are, what is on his heart. And that's that drawing near to God where we come into his presence and we, we lay down our own agendas and we make ourselves fully available to him. Lord, what, what do you desire? What do you want? What is on your heart and your mind so that I can partner with that And then by my agreement and by my decrees and declarations, release that the will of God, his rule and his reign on the earth. And in doing so, we are advancing the kingdom. Mm. So when the Lord said to me, okay, you know, I want you to lay down law school and legislate through prayer. I had no grid, you know, of an understanding for what that meant. But over the years in the place of prayer, I've, I've come to understand and experience how there are so many things in, 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 there are many things in scripture where the Lord says, ask of me, ask of me the nations, right? Mm-hmm. As your inheritance, you know, ask me, you know, ask the Lord of the harvest, you mm-hmm. know, that he will release laborers into the harvest field. There are many instances where the Lord does invite us to ask, ask, seek, and knock, right? That's a perpetual invitation we have before the Lord. But there are other things that are ours, right? By the word of God, there are promises that he's made to us. There are inheritances for us to lay hold of. There are, there's a will of God expressed in his word for Mm. us to come and to agree with. And by our agreement and our declarations and our decrees, we are releasing that into the earth realm, you know, in faith, by our faith-filled decrees. So it's been a whole process, you know, learning what legislating through prayer is, but it's a dynamic of, of prayer. It's an essential part of prayer that all of us as believers need to step into. Oh, well, I think you laid it out beautifully. Well said. That was just a preach, girl. I love it. I love it. And when we look at um at intercession, obviously um the the prophetic and, and insight through the spirit just couples so beautifully with um with releasing intercession in the earth. So um how do you see the two complementing one another? Oh, right. Prophetic intercession. We hear yeah. that term often mm. where, you know, in, in scripture tells us that we, you know, we often pray amiss, right? Meaning we pray and we don't see answers to our prayers and we'll get frustrated because we don't see answers to our prayers, mm. but it's because we're praying amiss, meaning we are missing the target. We are not hitting the bullseye in prayer. 
But when we come before the Lord in that posture of waiting before him to see what he has to say, listening for his voice, right? To receive the agenda of heaven, right? And we, we're, we're essentially waiting for prophetic revelation. We're, mm. we're waiting for the Lord to, to show us things, right? In the realm of the spirit that by the natural, we have no knowledge of. And where we're in that place of, of waiting on the Lord for that revelation, that prophetic revelation, then that's when we can convert that into prayers that hit the mark, into prayers that we're not praying amiss, we're hitting the target, and that's where we're going to see answers to our prayers. You know, and also when we pray, in um, one of my favorite scriptures is out of Romans chapter 8, verse, starting in verse 28, where it says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. What is this weakness? That we do, know, do not know how to pray as we should. But the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And it says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good, um, for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And very often we get frustrated in prayer because we're not seeing things work out for our good. But if we if we notice here, it says, and we know God works things for our good. It begins with the word with the word and. It's a conjunction, meaning that that is fully dependent on the scriptures, the verses that are right before it, which speaks of us having this weakness where we don't have all the revelation. We don't know all that is in the mind of God. We don't know all that's in the heart of God. But if we'll come into that place of partnership with the Holy Spirit and allow him to lead us in prayer, even praying by the Holy Spirit, praying in with groanings too deep for words, he reveals to us, right? We receive revelation of the heart and the mind of God, his plans and his purposes, his will and his ways. And then we can convert that, right, into intercession or even just by the Holy Spirit it, praying it through us. We may not even know what we're praying, mm. but then we're going to see all things work out for our good. And so when we pray, it's not enough for us to just simply ask and petition and make requests based on what we see and what we're experiencing in the natural. We have to set our sights above. Very we good. Have to take our seat, right? Seated with Christ in heavenly places. And in that place, receive revelation, receive proper perspective from that place. And from that place is where we're releasing those decrees and those declarations on the earth that align with the will of God. And then we'll see all things come together for our good. Girl, you need to write a book. <laughs> this is really beautiful, really well said, very easy, just to very practical uh, because I think people become frustrated in prayer and it's because, as you say, they're not actually seeing the whole, well, we prophesy in part, <clears throat> excuse me, but perhaps they're just not looking with spiritual eyes to see right. what the Father's saying and to hear what he's saying to be able to come into agreement with his will and pray according to his will that's brilliant so beautifully said thank you that's so cool and um also and i i do think this then pertains to hope because i was going to ask you so how do we remain as a people in the place of hope when it comes to prayer but you mentioned that we can become frustrated when we don't understand his will and his heart and 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 then get discouraged when we don't see the prayers answered and so do you believe well I don't want to put words in your mouth um, but by seeing his plans and purpose would that be a part of remaining in the place of hope in prayer absolutely absolutely and and for remaining in the place of hope in prayer there okay three practical things yes practical yes. things, but they're also spiritual but I love it very practical right Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says faith is the substance or the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence or our conviction, our confidence of things not seen, right? So if we take that scripture as, as kind of like our, our roadmap here, we recognize, and, and also where um, where the Lord says to us, you know, multiple times, right, that whatever we, we ask for in prayer, like Matthew 21, 22, we'll receive if we have faith, right? Mm. And, and, and 
faith, right? According to Hebrews 11, 1, faith is a substance, the assurance of things hoped for. Faith and hope are tied together. They're essential. So in, in seeking hope in the place of prayer, in seeking, okay, we have to pray with faith. That is how our prayers will be answered, right? Mm. So how is it that we sustain this hope, right? We find, we build our prayer. We build ourselves up in prayer. So number one, three things I want to say were practical. So here, here's what I do, right? To remain in hope and remaining in hope through my journey of seeing my son, you know, by mm. the age of 11, he had been through 12 surgeries, including full on open heart surgery. Wow. I mean, wow. remaining in hope for things, you know, when we're on prayer assignments, even for our nation, where we're, you know, just for breakthrough in our church. I mean, so many different approaches, right? To prayer, but remaining in hope and in faith in the place of prayer. Number one, I look for and find the Lord in my journey. Like the yeah. journey that I've already walked. Beautiful. I so this is notes. like building an altar of memorial stones. Yeah. It's like, okay, I may find myself in a place where I'm frustrated, you know, struggling for hope. You know, I, I, I feel like, oh my goodness, I don't have faith for this. The first thing I do is I look back. I look back on my journey. Mm. God, where, where can I look to and see your faithfulness? Where can I look to and see your promises fulfilled? Where can I look to and see the manifestation of your word? Like, and start building like an altar of memorial stones, you know, or like a book of remembrance. Just start mm. journaling or go back into your journals, you know, and, and just, just start rehearsing, remembering the faithfulness of God. Very and every which is. He answered that prayer. He performed that miracle. He came through in that way. And it could be in my personal life, but also in the lives of others. It could be looking directly in the scriptures, you know, the stories and scriptures that build faith within us. So that's building faith, number one, by finding him in my journey, the trajectory of life that I've already, that I've already walked. Number two, finding him in the moment. Mm. Like there, there are moments that I just have this to ask, so like, good. Right there in the moment, Jesus, where are you in the room? Yeah. You know, or, or just finding him in a season of waiting, you know, like finding him in that, in that season of waiting where, where, oh, I just finding his presence, finding his eyes. I, I'll talk about his eyes later, but um, <laughs> finding him in the struggle, in the suffering, right? In that situation. And, but here's the thing. I don't, I don't always, I won't always see him clearly or see exactly how he's working in the moment. But when I come into that place of seeking him and waiting in his presence, the assurance, the confidence, the conviction comes in experiencing his presence mm. and knowing he's there. And even if I don't see all the exact ways in which he's working, all the exact strategy of the Lord that's being, you know, that he's, he's carrying out, I may not see all those details. He may not reveal them to me in that precise moment, but he reveals his presence right, mm. and his character and his yes. glory. And that gives me the assurance that even if I cannot see clearly right now, I can see him. And I yep. know he's with me and he's for me and he's working things out for my good, right? And that Running. gets back to that Romans 8, you know, chapter 8 passage that we've read. Yes. Um, and then the third thing is I, I look for him and I find him in my future. Yeah, very and good. That is getting back to my the prophetic promises, you know, promises in scripture or even prophetic words that have been spoken specifically over my life. And I pull out those prophetic words and I pull out those prophetic promises and I search the scriptures for, okay, what do you have to say for my future as it relates to this specific situation, this hardship, this place of suffering or pain that I'm going through. And I lay hold of those prophetic promises. I lay hold of those words, his words in the scriptures, and I make them my weapons. Come on, yes. to war, against Come on. Hope, war against despair, war against defeat, war against the deception of the enemy that would say, you're alone. There's no way out of this. You're always going to be stuck in this situation. Make them, even as Paul admonished Timothy, right? To wage a good 
warfare, right? With the words, yes, yep. the words that had been spoken over him. So find him in your past, find him in your present, find him in your future. That's a and great way. As like building blocks for yes. the walls that we hope for, right? We can envision them like building blocks, the past, the present, the future, building blocks for erecting this wall of that, whatever that thing is that we are hoping for, right? And the mortar that holds it all together is our faith, our faith in the Lord that we're building, right? We're building ourselves up in our most holy faith, right? As we pray in the spirit to get the mind of the Lord, the heart of God, but even these three practical steps, we're finding him in your journey, finding him in the moment, and then finding him in your future. Wow, that's very good. And I love, oh my gosh, I love everything you said. And I think particularly finding him in your future, even when you can do that personally, but you can do that for any situation, for a nation, for the church and finding the, the hope, as you said, for where he have us go. That's so very good. Now you mentioned his eyes. Tell me about his eyes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, ah, you can't please be hanging on that one. Um, when I when I find myself in a difficult place, it could be, oh, maybe maybe I came in, to, you know, it's it's a season of hardship, or I'm for whatever reasons, I I'm I'm just feeling kind of dry, or I'm um you know, or I'm, I'm, there's pain, you know, maybe a betrayal, whatever it is, mm. there's always been this continual invitation. Like just find my eyes, find the eyes of Jesus. And that came out of this beautiful encounter that I had with the Lord. It was a two-part encounter. Um, so I'll just go over it real quickly where, um, I was, I was, in my church at the time, it was year, a couple years ago, several years ago, and I was in my church at the time, guest speaker, you know, did an altar call. I don't remember what the message was about, but I went up front and I'm just, you know, in, in full abandon, you know, to the Lord. And, and in that moment, I just went into a full on open vision where everything around me disappeared. And I found myself standing on like a bluff or like a cliff. And, um, and I'm looking all around me and I can see clouds all around me, like the outer space, like the universe, the expanse of the universe Whoa. all around me. And I can see the globe of the earth out in front of me, like in the distance, out in front of me, it's rotating like super slowly. I'm seeing the, you know, the form of the nations of the earth. And I'm thinking, am I in heaven? And I turn, I turn to my side and well, I realize that I'm holding on to something and I look at my hand and I realize that I'm holding on to someone's thumb. And it like all of this happened in, in split seconds, all of this, right? Yes, yeah. And I, and I look up and it's Jesus. And in that moment, like I was captivated, like we locked eyes in that moment. And it was these blazing, fiery eyes of Jesus. And I'm a petite lady. I'm only four feet, 10 inches, okay? Um, but in that open vision, I was tiny, like a toddler size, but I had these big, huge, massive eyes. So when I locked eyes with Jesus, it was like my big eyes of wonder locked in with his fiery gaze. And it was like, fire and light and beauty and love and all this emanating from him and drawing me in and he started just affirming me as of like telling me oh I'm so happy I'm so happy that you're here with me I've longed for you to be here with me and and he just started affirming me in my identity and who I was and how he, he was just delighting over me and he was going on and on and on and on here's the thing the whole time that Jesus was speaking to me his mouth wasn't moving and he wasn't making any sound. He was speaking to me with his eyes. And I fully could hear like all inside of me. I could hear and comprehend everything that he was Beautiful. saying. And, and I started asking him questions and I'm asking, well, well, Jesus, what am I doing here? And and what's that over there? And is that the earth? Is that like, are we, are we in heaven? And he's answering all of my questions and, you know, and, and I start asking him, well, what's over there? What's over there? And, and I won't go into all the details because it felt like we were there for hours and hours and hours, but wow. I'm asking him all of these questions 
and he's answering me. But the entire time, our mouths weren't moving. And again, no audible sound. The two of us are communicating with our eyes. So this oh, went that's on, it felt like an eternity. And then I come out of, you know, and Jesus was telling me all, he was telling me about his plans for what he wanted to do in that region of the world and in that nation and you know what his plans were here and his desire for for that people group and he's telling me all these things and I'm like whoa that's so amazing it's so beautiful and I'm just blown away that he's sharing these things with me wow and after a long time of this happening I came out of that open vision but that was only part one I mean I came out of it and then I was, I mean, I was just so distraught. I'm like, no, Jesus, I want to be back with you in that place again. <laughs> and then over the course of um, close to two years, like it, it became this journey of, I just, I just want to find his eyes again. I just want to find his eyes again. And I would close my eyes mm -hmm. and I, I'd, I'd see his eyes and it, it still wasn't a full on, you know, open vision and I'm in heaven and all of that, but I could just like see from that from that open vision, his eyes. So my, it was like all I was hungering for and all that I was pursuing was just to find and fix my gaze on the fiery eyes of Jesus. Mm, and, um, and then close to two years later, it was another, we're at Christ for the Nations. There was a guest speaker. He started speaking about laying our lives down for the nations. And I go up front and I'm just complete. I mean, I'm bawling, crying. And I'm like, God, send me anywhere. You know, one of those things. I'll give you my whole life. I'll go do whatever Beautiful. you want. You know, send me. And in the moment the the speaker comes, he, he, I'm waiting for the speaker to come and, you know, pray for me. And he comes to me and, um, and I hear his voice say, grab my thumb. And I'm, I'm thinking, what? Like, I didn't <laughs> make a connection, right? And I'm like, what? I didn't even want to open my eyes. I found it so weird. I didn't want to look yeah. at him. And I'm like, because you know, when, when a kid, when a little kid comes to you and says, you know, pull my finger, what follows is not present <laughs> usually, right? And I'm just like, it's just a joke. And he just, he just said it again. He said, just hold on to my thumb. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm just going to go with this. And I open my eyes and I see his hand and I fold onto his thumb. And when I did, I went right back into that same open wow. vision from almost two years prior. And I'm like, Jesus, thank you for bringing me back here. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, I love you. I'm so grateful. And I'm just gushing over this. And he started, he's like, Melissa, I'm so happy to have you back. And again, just speaking all this life and encouragement into me. And I'm like, I'm like, will, will you tell me more? Will you teach me more? And again, he starts pointing to different nations and different regions. And I want to wow. eradicate poverty there. And I want to raise up a people in power there. And I want to rescue the children there. And I want to raise up, you know, a church and signs and wonders. He starts telling me all wow. these things. He's like, yeah, Melissa, go ahead. And I'm like, okay. And then he starts telling me what to say. So then he's telling me, mm. well, you, yeah, you, you, you decree that over the nations and you prophesy that over the nations. Very yes. Good. And he's thanking me for his agreements. And then he's, he's telling me what to say. And he's, you know, going on and on and, and we're going back and forth. I mean, for what seemed like an eternity in this dialogue. And he's telling me his thoughts and his desires and his plans and giving me permission to decree that over the nations. Wow. And then. After a while, he starts, he asks me, he's like, well, Melissa, I, I want to know what, what you think. I want to know what, what's on your heart and what you mm. desire. And I'm like, what? You, you want to know what I think? And this whole time, we're still only speaking with our eyes. And I'm like, you want to know what I think? Like, so and I'm cool. just, I mean, I am just floored that. Jesus would ask what I think, but right in this time, I've been on a journey with him of, of getting to know his heart and, and what he desires. So mm. I'm like, I know the Lord was asking me because he knew that I'd gone through this process of learning his, his mind and his thoughts and his heart right. and a higher perspective and all of that. And I'm like, okay, okay. Well, um, well in, in this part of the world, like, I'd really like to see that culture transformed and where the people rise up in authority and you know you break off those orphan mindsets and he's like 
yeah, that's good, Melissa. That's good. Go ahead. Go ahead. And he, and I'm like, okay, okay. So he's like, release that over that nation. And, and so things like that just went on and on and on and on. And I'm going for it. And I'm, you know, and I'm, <laughs> yes, and I'm all into it and I'm all excited. And, 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 and then in one moment I turn, right. And in this second vision, I didn't mention this, but I went from his thumb to holding his entire hand. Right all the significance and the fivefold and all these things with that but <laughs> I'm, I'm holding his hand the entire time because I never let go of his hand speaking to each other with our eyes but as I would direct my words over the earth I was speaking with my voice right? mm. so I'm releasing all of this over the nations fully into it going for it with all my might and then in one instance I turn and he's not there and everything inside me just exploded where I, I shouted out, Jesus, I can't do this without you. And in that instant, in that instant, well, okay, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. In that instant where I turned and he wasn't there, in my other hand appeared a sword. And that sword was so heavy, it fell down to the ground under the weight of it. I couldn't lift it. And that's when I, 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 I shouted out, Jesus, I can't do this without you. And in that moment, I felt the hands of Jesus on my back, fire surge through me, through my arm, lifted up that sword and effortlessly, like it weighed nothing. I started wow. to weave that sword over the nations and went right back into making these authoritative decrees over the nations of the earth. As he said, I give you authority. So as I've gone you know, in, my journey in prayer, I, and, and after that, I came back out of that, you know, that vision, that open vision, but that really marked me. Mm. And, and as I have gone in my journey of prayer, you know, and, and, you know, maturing in things like, you know, prophesying over nations or spiritual warfare and binding and loosing, or, you know, sometimes I'll get all worked up and I'm like, you know, shouting at the devil and doing all these things, right? It's like, I, I hear Holy Spirit come and whisper, Melissa, how did it all begin? Mm. And I'm reminded, oh, by focusing on the fiery eyes of Jesus, mm. by locking Beautiful. into his gaze. And when I'm dealing with hardships and when I'm, you know, feeling discouraged and all of these things that are hard on our hearts, right? Mm. I'm always reminded, Melissa, find the fiery eyes of Jesus. Like the strategy has never changed. It's always remained the same. Mm. And, um, and I've had so many fiery eyes of Jesus encounters, um, but it always goes back to that same thing. And um Beautiful. Yeah, that place of intimacy. That's stunning. I love it. I love it. Um, well, Melissa, it's just been so beautiful to have you. My gosh, I've loved everything you've shared today. Um, but do you have a, a word for those listening? I'd love even if you could, I mean, as you feel led, but even pray for us as well, just to find him in that place of intimacy too. That'd be just beautiful if you don't mind. Yeah, um, the Lord gave me a scripture and it's interesting because I wasn't even planning to share that story, <laughs> um, but it's interesting how it all, you know, ties together and led me to this, this verse that the Lord gave me, Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse nine, the eyes of the Lord <laughs> search the whole earth in order to strengthen or show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are fully committed to him. I just want to encourage you, even as the Lord is looking and searching throughout the whole earth for fully committed hearts, for fully surrendered lives, he's looking for those that are in, that have postured their hearts in that way. Like, let him find you looking right back at him. Let him find you with a fixed gaze. Let him find you 
with your vision locked into the eyes of Jesus because he wants to strengthen you. He wants in your, in your moments of weakness where you may find yourself, okay, out of hope and, and in despair and discouraged and like you've got no strength to carry on. He says, I, if, if he finds his, your eyes looking back at him, wholeheartedly committed to him in surrender. He says, he's going to strengthen you. He's going to be your strength in that place of weakness. He's going to rise up and show himself strong on your behalf and raise you up as a victor and raise you up as an overcomer and raise you up, come on, in the strength and the authority of Jesus. So look mm -hmm. to the fiery eyes of Jesus because you're always, always going to find beautiful things there. You know, it's like mm -hmm. Moses and that burning bush. He turned to the burning bush and there he found purpose and he found direction and he found strength and courage and he found life. And I just prophesy to you that as you turn to the fiery eyes of Jesus, even as Moses turned to that fiery burning bush, that you are going to discover purpose in the eyes of Jesus and identity and direction for your life and the strength and the courage that you need to carry on, to move forward with what he's calling you into and what he has entrusted you with. He's just looking for those that are fully committed, hearts fully entrusted to him so he can show himself strong on your behalf. No more striving. I just, in Jesus' name, break striving off of you. Mm. And I bless you with the grace to come into the rest that comes with allowing your vision, your outlook on life to be recalibrate, recalibrated in the place of his presence, in that place of intimacy with him, where you will find how to live with a fixed gaze. I bless Beautiful. you in Jesus' name. Oh, amen. I'm overwhelmed. That was just wonderful. It was such a delight to have you. Please come again. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I've just so enjoyed everything you shared. Thank you for your wisdom and your just your generosity in sharing your journey and, and the, the special things between you and Jesus. Thank you for sharing those with us. We appreciate it. It's just been wonderful. Thank you for being my guest, Melissa. Oh, it's been a joy to be on with you, Sarah. Wasn't that just a beautiful feast? <laughs> my goodness, the insight, the revelation, the understanding around intercession. What a gift to us today. Thank you so much, Melissa, for being my guest. If you enjoyed that podcast, you can follow Melissa uh, in all the socials. Just search for Melissa Medina. You can also follow me as I follow Christ. Just look for the happy prophet. If you would like to know more about me and what I do, you can go to sarahcheeseman.com where all the fun things are there. I love you, my friends. Oh, something just popped into my head. Great news, the Academy, the Glory City Academy, where I teach, I train in the prophetic, has just received its accreditation, which is so exciting. We're going to be fully accredited um, from here on in. So if you want to know more about the Glory City Academy, you can go to uh, glorycity.com. It's there. Uh, super duper exciting. I'm um, just with, uh, obviously, we've loved to train and equip people over the last five years. But to be able to um, equip them further and make it more available to people is super exciting. Uh, so check it out um, today if you'd like to. I love you, my friends. Your life is significant. Be yourself. Change the world. Mm -hmm.